No one, including Osama bin Laden, thought that the World Trade Towers in New York would be completely <coughs> collapsed when struck by airplanes. Until, of course, that's what happened. That does not diminish the courage of the firemen who rushed into the burning towers to help evacuate the people who just miraculously, I mean, you look back on that day, that there are 50,000 people that work in those towers and 3,000 people died. And so the net effect of those firemen sacrificing themselves was huge in facilitating the evacuation of the towers before they fell. <coughs> but just one decade after that tragedy, there was a crisis in Japan. An earthquake and the following tsunami crashed into Japan's Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant, making a crisis that was in part a crisis of nature, but also of human creation at the same time resulting in one of the most dangerous situations faced in Asia since World War II. The potential of deaths from radiation was almost impossible to calculate, but the radiation leaking inside the plant made it impossible for anyone to go inside and take action to stem the danger. The 800 employees of the Fukushima nuclear plant were immediately evacuated while robots were sent in with cameras and detectors to confirm their fears that a major radiation leak was entirely out of order. It was at that point that 50 men, firemen and, and nuclear power plant workers, volunteered to go in. The Asian media referred to them as the Fukushima 50. Prime Minister Nato Khan said, frankly, these workers are now prepared to die which was a good thing because many of them did die. And you have to assume that all of them have dramatically shortened their life expectancy by exposing themselves to such high levels of radiation. I doubt that anyone volunteering for military service or any other form of public service could have been as certain of stepping into dramatic personal sacrifice as did the Fukushima 50. And as the weeks went on, their numbers grew. They tried to have fairly short exposure to being inside the plant, and many other volunteers followed, but they were still referred to as the Fukushima 50. It wasn't like a superhero movie. It wasn't Die Hard, or Red, or G.I. Joe, in which people heroically save the world and then all the heroes live in the end. Fukushima 50 didn't even fix the broken reactor. I mean, it's still leaking radioactive waste into the ocean. They just made a horrible situation much better. And by doing it, they saved a lot of people's lives. But they shortened their own or ended their own by being willing to do it. Now, two years have passed. I'm curious, do any of you remember having heard of the Fukushima 50? Some of you heard of them. I don't know any of their names. Do you know any of their names? There was some media coverage of their heroism and their personal sacrifices at the time, but the amount of news coverage was not 1% of what we've heard about the British royal baby, or for that matter, Anthony Weiner's junk shots. <laughs> We read portions of the Old Testament story about the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I want to clarify this. These biblical narratives are not history. This is a story. A lot of the myths of the Old Testament were built around something that was in their environment. So there were villages in Palestine that were charred, possibly from volcanic activity or something else. So there were these villages that they knew were burned down and covered in lava or whatever. And so a story grows up around that to explain why that's there. It's called an etiology, when a, when a myth grows up to explain a certain event. But the notion that, that uh, 
God burns up cities for sinfulness is absurd and offensive, and even though it's in the Bible, I don't think it's going too far to say that it's blasphemous. God doesn't burn up cities for any sinful activity within those cities. And if you have difficulty believing me, let me encourage you to visit Washington, D.C. and see that it has not been burned up. Uh, and if God were so inclined to burn up cities for ridiculous sinfulness, that place surely would not be here anymore. The charred remains of an ancient village may have given Jews a reason to create a narrative, but the point of the narrative is what gives the account gravity in Scripture. What we look at here today is a case of pleading between Abraham and the Almighty, which is not unlike other prophetic pleadings in the Old Testament. Moses pleaded with God, you know, don't do this, you know, turn, turn back, don't do this. God has told Abraham to get his family out of harm's way while he burns up a sinful city. And Abraham tries to bargain with God. Abraham says, but Lord, what if there's 50 people that don't deserve to be killed. And the Lord says, well, yeah, I wouldn't kill 50 people that didn't deserve it. So Abraham presses his point, not to, you know, not to tell you how to be God, but what if there's 20? And God relents and says, yeah, if you can think of 20 people, then I'll spare the city. Finally, Abraham says, well, what about 10? What if there's 10 good people? Could you really? There's not many good people. Can you really afford to burn up 10 good people? God relents and gives Abraham the opportunity to name 10 good people. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't think of 10 neighbors and countrymen that deserve to be spared. What makes these stories powerful is its existential point. Could you? Could you name 10 good people? What I find interesting about the martyrs of our memory is that they're all dead. When I took a course in religious biography at Harvard, we studied the lives of some of modern hist history's most remarkable people. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, Oscar Romero, Reinhold Niebuhr. And even though my professor, Dr. Harvey Cox, had known most of those people as his personal friends, to all of us who were his students, they were dead. When we bought this building, I framed some social justice posters and some pictures of people that I wanted you to see as you walked through the building to remind you of what we're striving. And I, I put up pictures of the people that I just mentioned, King and, and Dorothy Day and Gandhi and, and Black Elk and many others. And, and there's only one picture um, of one of those social justice heroes out there that's still alive, may still be alive. And that's Wang Wei Lin, the guy who's standing in front of the tanks in Tiananmen Square in China. We think that's Wang Wei Lin, and we assume that he's still alive. That took place in 1989. So if we were to personalize this text, if you were standing in Abraham's shoes and God told you that you needed to go to the lake for the weekend, or Hawaii, depending upon what your job is, um, <laughs> because Springfield has just pushed God a little bit too far. And trust me, if the Lord God Almighty was paying attention to some of our city council meetings, it could happen. So, could you name, could you name ten people that would, would be worth saying the city was worth saving? Would you name the mayor? Do you know who the mayor is? Could you name the superintendent of schools? Do you know who he is? The city manager? The director of the United Way? What about our Catholic bishop or the president of the Assemblies of God? How about some of the people that are sitting around you here in church? Can you get up to 10? At everyone's funeral, we're always talking about a great person. That's an interesting thing about funerals is that at everyone's funeral, they were a great person. 
even if no one in the room had bothered to notice that they were a great person prior to their death. Abraham was asked to quickly come up with the names of ten people who were alive and lived in his neighborhood, and he couldn't do it, and I suspect for the most part we couldn't either. I can't name a single one of the Fukushima 50. You may not know the names of more than one or two community leaders that I just mentioned. And I bet you you couldn't even name the name of the guy that stood in front of those tanks in Tiananmen Square, and I just told you who it was. Because our minds are not practiced in remembering good things. We are not practiced at that. We are practiced at remembering bad things. We are practiced at gossip and slander and libel, but we're not practiced at noticing what is good and honorable and filled with character among the leaders that are all around us. If I ask you to name the name of the New York governor who resigned because of his relationship with prostitutes, you could do it. If I ask you who the New York mayoral candidate is who's been sending pictures of his private parts to young women, you could say it. Or which governor got his housekeeper pregnant. Or which governor disappeared while visiting his mistress in Argentina. And if I ever think about running for governor, would somebody talk me out of it? This appears to be kind of a questionable group of people. But we all know them. We all know that about them. Which governor has managed to balance their state's budget while uh, continuing to keep their schools and their highways strong? We, uh, we don't know. Some of that is because we're trained to think about people's failings and to define them by their weaknesses. And whenever someone sticks their head up above the crowd, the majority instinct is to try to find some plausible reason to cut their head off their shoulders. Our government is starved for leadership, but no one really wants to step out of line. As soon as you step out to the front of the line, there's a hundred people that volunteer to put a, a dagger in your back. The progressive church is simply not making much progress in the world because progressives do not champion one another. The kind of a small group of us who are, are recognized preachers and, and teachers within the progressive Christian movement, and you just about can't get one of them to say something nice about one of the other ones. We're much more likely to cut one another down than to build one another up. We are afraid to praise anyone these days because we're afraid that if we do, if we push anyone up into the spotlight, that we will find a blemish on them. John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, no one that we now comfortably name as the great leaders in the first half of the 20th century could have withstood the scrutiny of our neo-Puritan witch hunts today. The only reason that we can name people like King and, and Gandhi and Romero is because they died before the 24-hour news cycle came into existence. If we had 24-hour news during their lifetimes, we would have found out things about them that would have made us want to ignore them. So I have two things to say about all this. A good sermon only has one point, so this is already a B-grade sermon. But I have two points. The first is that we need to decide right here and now that we're going to stop being led around by gossip. I encourage you, every time one of these salacious stories comes on the TV news, to change channels. And every time you see it in the newspaper, to turn the page. We have got to train ourselves to be grown-ups and stop acting like we were middle school students for the rest of our lives. We need to be much more concerned about what a person has done right, what they have accomplished, what, what they can do, than by how many black marks we can find to put on their moral scorecard. Capable, wonderful, intelligent, talented people make mistakes. Now, Anthony Weiner, he's just crazy. He, he's not talented, intelligent, insightful, or capable. He's just crazy. That's different. But I'm saying get your head out of the sheets and look at the world in a more balanced way. Besides, you know, folks, lions, lions don't spend a lot of time 
worrying about the opinions of sheep. You know, we've just got to let go of that. You don't really want to think like you're a part of the herd of sheep. The second thing that I want to suggest to you is that you try your best to live in a way where you earn a place on that short list. That when someone comes up with an opportunity to write a list of truly good people, that you've lived in a way that you make that list. Sure, if you stick your neck out, someone will try to cut your throat. But that famous poem that was mistakenly attributed to Mother Teresa, it may be tried because of over-repetition, but I'm going to read it again. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, others will be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. Now, folks, the only proverb that I can claim as my own that is original to me came to me after years of experience in ministry. My proverb says that if you light a candle in a dark place, you will draw bugs. I realized this after years of trying to do really good things in ministry and always being confronted by irrational, jealous, hypercritical, and sometimes plain old stupid opposition. And that was just the clergy. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be the one who is ready to be inconvenienced or to have to make a personal sacrifice to do some good thing. You may never be called upon to run into a nuclear reactor that is filling up with radioactive material. But aren't you glad that there were some people that had the courage and the character to do it? And really, wouldn't you like to be that kind of person that could make that kind of decision to be self-sacrificing for the benefit of strangers? Leon Bloy said that anyone who is a Christian who is not a hero is a pig. Now, I know you don't want to be pigs. So if Bloy is right, you know what you need to do. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. Don't be swayed by gossip or the fear of judgment. Go be a hero. Amen. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.